Right, let's do a cable calculation for an EV charge point. The mass is relevant for any circuit, and I'll also try to point out some considerations when you're installing an EV point. They're not that straightforward. So here's an overview of what we're going to be talking about. Start off with the method of installation, our cable choice, how it's getting installed in the building. Then we calculate the design current, then we select the protective device. Then we've got to consider is overload protection required. Then we move on to see if we need to apply any relevant correction factors. Then we select our final cable. We check our volt drop. Then we can confirm our cable choice is suitable for the load. So a method of installation. We have our design sequence and we have our design principles. We'll come back to this later in the video. But this is where we're sizing our final circuits and we're finding the cross-sectional area of the conductors that we need for this circuit. So our basic method of installation, it's an EV charger. The length of the circuit is 25 meters. It's clipped direct, and it's going through a high temperature section. That could be a conservatory, it could be a loft, a boiler room or something. And we're going to use twin and earth cable because it's all internal. We want to be looking in Appendix 4 of BS7671. This has got a list of all our reference methods, installation methods, it's got our correction factors, ambient temperature and such. Essential for our calculations. Then we have to calculate our design current. This EV charger is 7000 watts. So to get the design current, we divide the power, 7000 watts, by the voltage, which is 230. And we get our IB, our design current, of 30.43 amps. So next, we select the protective device. And this is the IN, the rated current of the protective device. That's the rating printed on the device itself. So if we're following our coordination, IB has to be less than or equal to IN, our design current has to be less than the rating of the protected device. The next size up from 30.43 amps is a 32 amp protected device. There's other things to consider as well because it's an EV charge point. We're using an RCBO. That's got to be double poles, which live and neutral. And because the EV charger can produce DC current, we need a protected device that can handle that. So it needs to be at least a Type A. So our IN is 32 amps. Coordination is achieved. The design current is less than the rated current of the protective device. And we can move on. Then we have to consider is overload protection required. You could argue that an EV charge point has a fixed load, 7,000 watts, a little bit like a shower. You can't overload one shower. It's going to put its maximum design current and that's it. EV charging is slightly more complicated though. You might not overload this one particular charger, but it depends what else is going on. You've got to consider what's going on in the building. A shower might only be on for 10, 15 minutes. An EV charger will be pulling its current for many, many hours. So you've got to consider what effect that might have on the installation as a whole. And there might be more than one EV charger. We're going to calculate the overload protection is required because EV chargers have load management and load curtailment, making sure it doesn't pull too much current. If you're pulling 32 amps and then you've got the rest of the house to consider as well, you might be starting to get to the limit what your service fuse can comfortably carry. Of course, we've got a relatively large load for a long period of time. The DNO want to know about this as well because it might affect their systems. When we're doing our cable calculation, when we're doing our correction factors, we're going to use IN, the rate of current of the protected device. If overload protection wasn't required, you can use IB. And so that's sometimes useful in your cable calculations. You might be able to use a smaller cross-sectional area cable, for example. But we are using IN, overload protection is required. Next, we have to think of any stresses put on this cable as it goes from A to B. This is about temperature, really. Is there anything that's going to heat this cable up? Or is there anything that's going to stop this cable from losing any heat that it generates? Twin earth cable has a maximum operating temperature of 70 degrees C. So we have a group of correction factors. If it's buried in the ground, that's going to affect its ability to lose heat. If it's going through thermal insulation, again, that's going to affect its ability to lose heat. 
if the cable is installed in a high ambient temperature, the cable's ambient temperature will be closer to its maximum operating temperature. So we take that into consideration. If the cables are all grouped together, it's going to affect its ability to lose heat, but it also might be heated by other cables as well. So we want to find IT. This is the cable's tabulated current. What the current carrying capacity of the cable should be after correction factors have been applied. We're often derating. We're dividing by less than one. So in this example, we're going through an area with a high ambient temperature of 40 degrees C. And for each correction factor, there's various tables. We look at table 4B1 and BS7671. So we divide our IN, 32 amps, by 0 0.87. And it gives us a new value of 36.78. Now this is our tabulated current. Then we have to look in the book to find out a cable that can carry 36.78 amps. The cable's not carrying 36.78 amps. Because of the thermal stress put on the cable, we now need to use a cable that has the capacity to carry this. We only use the worst case correction factor unless two or more factors exist in the same place. If you were going through thermal insulation in one part of the run, then further on down the line, you had a high ambient temperature, those two things aren't happening at the same time on a particular section of cable. You would use the correction factor that derated the cable the most, the lower value number. If the both existed at the same time, say you were in a hot loft and in thermal insulation, you would use both correction factors to find your IT. And you can see going through more than 500 millimeters of insulation as a derating factor of 0 0.5. And sometimes this just makes the cable choice impractical. The cross-sectional area becomes too large. It's difficult or impossible to terminate and it becomes expensive as well. So you need to think of a different route for your cable. Certainly always try to avoid insulation. It has a terrible effect on your cable ratings. So with our IT of 36.78 amps, we need to find a cable that can carry that. There's lots and lots of tables in BS7671, depending on the type of cable, the type of conductor, that gives the current carrying capacity. There's a couple of tables you can use for twinning earth. But we're going to use table 4D2A, multi-core 70 degrees C, thermoplastic insulated and thermoplastic sheathed cables. We look through the table, reference method C, clip direct, and we want 36.78, 4 mil 36, that's not good. So 6 mil is 46 amps. So 46 is obviously higher than 36.78. So we're going to use 6 millimeter squared cable. The current carrying capacity of the cable for continued service under the installed conditions, that's your IZ, is 46 amps. So our cable is 20 and earth, 6 millimeter squared. Now we've got our cable size, we have to check that we haven't got too much volt drop for the length of the circuit. The longer the circuit length, the greater the voltage loss will be. And volt drop can cause problems. It affects the actual voltage getting to an appliance. So an appliance might not be so efficient. It can cause motors to run slowly. Any kind of heating elements might not get to the correct temperature. Lighting could be dimmed. And in this example, an EV charge point possibly affect the speed that the battery is recharged. Again, it's all relatively simple sums. And in Appendix 4, we've got all the tables for our conductors. And there's a section for millivolt per amps per meter. This is what we use when we're checking our volt drop. The formula is volt drop equals millivolts per amps per meter times the design current times the length, and we divide that by a 1,000 to get from millivolts to volts. So in this example, 6 millimeter squared cable has got a, a millivolts per amps per meter of 7.3. The design current was 30.43 amps, and the length was 25 meters. So we times them all together, divide by a 1,000, and it gives us our volt drop of 5.55 volts. There's limits in BS7671 the amount of volt drop that's permissible. Lighting 3%, other uses is 5%, so this is not lighting. So we're going to use the 5% value. 5% 5 of 230 is 11.5 volts. That's the maximum volt drop allowed. And as we can see, our volt drop is 5.55 volts. 
which is well under the 11.5 volts. So volt drop for this cable and this set of circumstances is acceptable. There is a preliminary check you could do right at the beginning to see if the cable might be suitable. I'll show you that at the end. So anyway, that's how we check our volt drop. So next we can consider our earth fault loop and pins. And if automatic disconnection of the supply has got to be confirmed. This is the calculated method. Obviously the circuit's not installed yet, so we can't test it. So our formula for ZS is ZE plus R1 plus R2. We start off with the R1 plus R2. This is six millimeter squared twin in earth. So the line conduct is six millimeters. The R2, the CPC is 2.5 millimeter squared. And that's got a milliohm per meter of 10.49. So the sums is the milliohms per meter times the length divided by a thousand. So that's 10.49 times 25 divided by a thousand. And that gives us 0.26 ohms. And the outside guide the milliohms per meter tables are at 20 degrees C. Now, because this is a calculation, we need to check them at maximum operating temperature. So we need to go from 20 degrees to 70 degrees C. That's an increase of 50 degrees. And the simplified formula for temperature correction is 1 plus 0 0.004 times the temperature increase. So 0 0.004 times 50. Add the 1. It's 1 1.2. So our correction factor to get from 20 degrees to 70 degrees C is 1.2. So we times our 0 0.26 by 1.2. And that would increase our R1 plus R2. To 0 0.31 ohms. So now we've got our R1 plus R2, 0 0.31 ohms. We're just going to go with a maximum ZE of 0 0.35, maximum for our TNCS system. So we add our 0 0.35 ZE to 0 0.31, our R1 plus R2. And so our calculated ZS is 0 0.66 ohms. And for a 32 amp type B RCBO, the maximum. ZS and BS7671 is 1.37 ohms. 0 0.66 is obviously less than 1.37. So our calculated ZS is good. We we'll need to calculate the perspective fault current to make sure that the protective device is going to operate within the required time. So the formula for that is 230 times 0 0.95. That's the correction factor C min for voltage fluctuations. And we divide that by our ZS, which is 0 0.66, and that gives us our perspective fault current, which is 331 amps. A type B RCBO for instantaneous tripping, it's five times the rate of current, so five times 32 is 160 amps. We've got a perspective fault current of 331 amps. With those figures, automatic disconnection of the supply will be confirmed. Next, we need to confirm that the cross-sectional area of our protective conductor, our CPC, is sufficient to allow it to withstand the energy let through of a protective device before the protective device operates under a fault. Basically, is the CPC big enough and it's not going to break under the fault current? So, this is our adiabatic equation, and this is for our protective conductor. The formula is S, the cross section area of the conductor, that's what we're trying to find out. And it's the square root of I squared T divided by K. I squared is the fault current. T is the operating time of the protective device. And K is the factor we get from BS7671. So we need to calculate the fault current. 230 times 0 0.95 divided by our ZS 0 0.66. We've got 331. The time. You look at the time current curves in BS7671. Remember, a type B RCBO, five times the rate of current was 160 amps. We're going to actually go with our calculated fault current, 331 amps. That will cause instantaneous tripping of the RCBO. It's higher than 160 amps, 331. So we're going to put for our time 0 0.1 seconds. So the square root of 331 squared times 0 0.1, you get the answer to that. Then you divide the answer by 115 and it gives us our minimum protective conductor size, which is 0 0.91 millimeters squared. Now, this is particularly important because we've got a twin and earth cable 
and the CPC is smaller than the line of neutral conductors. It's good to confirm that the CPC is sufficient. So in twin and earth, 6 mm squared twin and earth, the CPC is 2.5 mm squared. Our minimum size is 0.91 mm squared. So the adiabatic equation has shown us that our CPC of 2.5 mm squared is acceptable. Next, we need to consider thermal waste stand. This time we're checking that our live conductors are suitable. If there's a fault, we want to make sure the cable can handle that fault and the permitted limiting temperature of the conductor will not be exceeded. It's a rearrangement of the adiabatic. So we've got our factor for K. We've got the size of the live conductors this time, so at 6 mil. And we've got the fault current, and they're all squared. And so there's the sums. We divide the two and we get our time of 4.34 seconds. We know that we're going to have automatic disconnection of the supply in 0.1 second. Therefore, the value of thermal withstand of 4.34 seconds does confirm that the permitted limiting temperature of the conductor will not be exceeded during a fault. There is a preliminary calculation we can do to see what size cable we can use. It's a rearrangement of the voltage drop formula. and We're dividing millivolts by the design current times the length. And it'll give us our millivolts per amps per meter. If you remember, our maximum volt drop was 11.5 volts, which is 11,500 millivolts. So our design current, 30.43 times 25, gives the millivolts per amps per meter of 15.11. We need to be lower than that. We went for 6mm, which was 7.3. Here you can see that 4mm square cable has a millivolts per amps per meter of 11. So it's suggesting that we could use that. This is before we've done our correction factors. And it was a correction factor for a high ambient temperature, which moved us up to a 6mm squared cable. So this is a preliminary calculation. You can use it to dismiss cable sizes. But as we've seen, we still have other correction factors to apply. This is mentioned in BS7671 and Appendix 4, and it can be useful. So we've been through this design process, and we've got a cable that we're happy with for this particular set of circumstances. The cable calculation is just one part of the entire design, though. So I've got two sections here, the design sequence and design principles. The design sequence is taken from the electrical installation design guide and this is taking the design right from the very beginning. You've got to understand the building and its construction. You identify basic loads and safety systems and large load centers. Agree future needs and capacities. Determine load characteristics. Maximum demands. Determine supply characteristics. Design the distribution system. Then we size our final circuits. Check isolating and switching requirements. Verify compliance with BS7671. Have our final assessment. We manage any changes during construction. I mean, that obviously sounds like it's for large installs. But we could use those basic principles for our little small installation, can't we? On the design principle side, this is from your City Ingalls 2396 course. The characteristics of the supply. The nature of the demand. Supply systems for safety, environmental conditions, cross sectional area of conductors, which we've been doing, types of wiring and methods of installation, we've been doing that as well, protective equipment, isolating and switching, protective devices and switching, accessibility of electrical equipment, and prevention of mutual detrimental influences. These are quite handy, these guides, to give you a flow of work and what you need to consider and what you need to include. EV charging, I think, is particularly difficult. It's a constantly changing landscape. Regulations are changing all the time. Technology is changing all the time. Technology is moving quicker than the regulations. And there's equipment on sale which we're not sure which is compliant with the standards. It's an interesting time. I've just noted down here some things I think are worthy of consideration for an EV installation. That we have the issue of RCDs for DC currents. We have the increasing issue of open pen conductors, earth electrode suitability. We have to consider load curtailment and management when overloading the supply. Is the equipment compliant with the standards? 
We have to notify the DNO so they know what's going on. We don't want to cause issue on their network. Correct certification. We have to consider things like the location of the charger and fire risk assessment and insurance. This is all starting to come to light. The actual location of the EV charger. If the electric vehicle catches fire, apparently they're really difficult to put out. So this is getting insurance companies a little bit interested. We have to protect them from impact. The separation of the car chargers from each other. But the correct circuit protection, as before with the RCDs. Current transformers. We have some control cable as well going to the EV charger. One company has combined the two. There's some controversy about that. Can we have a combined cable with control and power? So that's just my thoughts on it. So installing an EV charger certainly isn't just like installing any radial circuit. There's a lot to consider. Then my advice would be to get yourself on a good course, which will go through all these issues and more. I hope that's been of some interest. And thank you very much for watching.